You're listening to The Solution, a podcast by Growers Mineral. I'm your producer, Russell Bobel. In today's episode, Marguerite Fall, Jim Hallbison, and Zach Smith discuss the topic of nematodes and why they matter to farmers. There's also a video version of these episodes available on YouTube. Search Growers Mineral on YouTube to find our channel. Now, on to the conversation. So, Jim, Zach, thank you for joining me again to talk about soil microbes. This is the fourth installment in our soil microbes series. We're going to focus on talking about nematodes today. Um, Zach, do you want to start us off and tell us just kind of a general what is a nematode? Yeah, for sure. Uh, They're mostly little microscopic worms. So some of them can get to a millimeter in size, which is visible to the naked eye if you're really looking closely. But a lot of them are also microscopic where they're not visible to the naked eye. Uh, So they're little worm-like creatures. Uh, They they exist across a, a lot of functions in the soil. Uh, from uh, the one that farmers will be most familiar with, where they parasitize plants, where they'll they'll uh, attack plant roots and and uh, destroy the cells in there, suck out the contents of the cells. But they also feed on bacteria, on fungi, on some organic matter, on each other. So they really cross a wide variety of uh, of functions and roles in the soil. And, and as such, they're, they're quite important in the soil, even if they're not as abundant as bacteria or fungi. So what are some different kinds of nematodes then? So I, I briefly mentioned there's, well, call the, the ones that attack the plants, call them herbivores. And um, they're, they're the most abundant of nematodes, but not by a wide margin. Um, so they'll, as I said, they'll, they'll exist mostly within the rhizosphere of a plant, which is a little area, two millimeter area around the roots. And they will uh, inject or they'll, they'll inject an enzyme into the root to get through the thick cell walls. And then they'll suck out the contents of the cells. And so this isn't a small problem as Jim can get into. It causes quite a bit of economic damage every year. But by no means is this the only role that nematodes fill. Uh, so we shouldn't we shouldn't be trying to get rid of them. Another, as I mentioned, is they uh, they're predatory. Most of the rest of them are predatory, so a lot of them will go after bacteria, and they'll do the same thing with bacteria: puncture the cell wall, suck out the insides. And then there's ones that do this with fungus as well. So they'll attack the hyphae, which is the the small strands that fungus will form in order to access new areas. Uh, they'll do the same thing, puncture the cell wall, suck out the insides. Uh, an interesting fact with their predatory nature is that they actually also, in doing so, they release nutrients into the soil. And the main one of those is ammonia. Uh, so basically nematodes don't require as much nitrogen as bacteria and fungus provides. So when they consume the bacteria and fungus, they will actually uh, e- emit ammonia, which is NH4. And so that that's then available. Ammonia is an inorganic form of nitrogen, which means that it's available to crops, to plants. And so that is one way that they can actually help fertilize the soil. Uh, some of them will go after organic matter. Uh, this is a very, very, very small portion of the po- nematode population that will do that. But some of them will. And in doing so, they will release nutrients the same way that bacteria and fungus do. do. And then the final major type are you could say cannibalistic nematodes. So they're basically a nematode group that, that predatorizes other nematodes. And so these all work together uh, in, in controlling populations. So if you'll remember uh, during each podcast we've done in each article I've written, I've always emphasized that there are two kind of rules that I really want people to keep in mind. And the first one is that soil microbe populations should be stable, but not static which means that they should be able to exist without immediate threat to their survival, but that they shouldn't be always the same. And then the second rule is that they all exist in an ecosystem, a sort of food web where you you need them interacting with each other in order to have a healthy ecosystem. And when we try to disrupt that, we, it will have uh, unintended and unpredictable consequences. And so nematodes probably, uh, exemplify these rules the best because they it kind of exist across a wide spectrum of roles. So you've got you've got the herbivores, 
which feed on the plants. You've got uh, those that are that are consuming bacteria and fungi, and you've got those that are consuming other nematodes. And so they're all it's all population control in that sense. So, for example, the the nematodes that will feed off of bacteria can actually have a uh, what's the term? Um, wow, uh, when you pruning. There it is, like what on a tree. If you prune a tree properly, you will actually encourage more and better growth of the tree. Now, if you prune it too much, you'll damage the tree. And if you don't prune it enough, you'll get a lot of inefficient growth. Like an apple tree is a prime example, where when you prune it enough, you get uh, a decent number, but also a decent size of apples. If you don't prune it, you'll get a tree that produces a lot of very small apples, or, or it might even go years without producing any. And if you over prune it, you're going to actually damage the tree. Uh, the same works in a predator prey relationship where if you don't have any predators, then the prey population gets out of control and that can damage that whatever they consume. And so in a forest ecosystem, the, the classic example is foxes and rabbits. If you have no foxes, then the rabbits will destroy a lot of the undergrowth and the vegetation. But if you have too many foxes, then they're going to destroy the rabbit population and, and it'll end up destroying their own population through starvation. Uh, so the same thing happens in the soil. Nematodes uh, consume bacteria. They're, comparatively, there are far fewer nematodes than there are bacteria, bacteria being the most abundant soil microbe. Um, but by consuming these bacteria, the nematodes, like any predator, will go after weaker, weaker organisms. They're not going to, a wolf pack's not going to try to take down the, the largest buck they can find. They try to take down the young or the sick. And the same thing happens in nematodes. They actually end up pruning the bacteria population. And if it's done to the right degree, it can actually increase and help the bacteria population, which then in turn will help the nematode population that's, that's uh, preying on it. And that the same holds true if you get the, the, the nematodes that, that will hunt other nematodes are actually a control on that relationship. So you're not going to get, if you have enough of the predatory nematodes, you're not going to get too many of the nematodes that feed on bacteria or fungi because the predatory ones are controlling that population. So you can see here how it's important that you have multiple layers of controls and how they each impact. So if you don't have enough predatory nematodes down the road, you might get uh, too much damage to the bacteria population. Whereas if you have uh, not enough of the, did I say not enough? If you have too many of the predatory nematodes, then you're going to end up with the case with an unpruned tree. Uh, and so it's interesting how these things all work together, where if, if it were possible to provide nematodes in a bug in a jug, throwing them in there, it, this is a very easy example to see how that could disrupt that relationship and that balance that's probably been reached naturally already in the soil. Uh, and so on that note, nematodes are present in all soils pretty well. They're very abundant in soils compared to like water ecosystems. Uh, they are less abundant in agricultural soils than they are in like a forest soil. Uh, and that's mostly due to, um, I'll say cultural practices like tillage and, and chemical fertilizer product or application, but they're still, they're still present in there. We should still be encouraging their, uh, their their populations and and one of the reasons is as farmers most of them will know about the type that parasitize roots but if you don't have the predatory nematodes that would feed on those other nematodes then you're going to end up with a larger problem. So these uh, nematodes don't seem very nice. <laughs> um, I'm feeling feeling bad for these other soil microbes. But um, hearing you talk about nematodes, what it makes me think of um, is is they seem almost like top of the food chain. Is that a thing, or do you kind of equate all these soil microbes as as equal and working together? I'd say yes to both of those. Okay. Even an apex predator like a polar bear or a tiger uh, is still very much working together with the entire ecosystem. It's a very necessary part. Uh, so nematodes are, are not apex predators. If you were only looking at soil microbes, then I guess they would be, I mean, even though they um, predatorize themselves, but there are other organisms in the soil, like, like macroscopic things that you can see, beetles and such that will consume nematodes. So by no means are they the apex predator. Um, they just, amongst microbes, you could call them the king of the microbes. 
because there there aren't. I, I shouldn't say that even because there are bacteria and fungus that will parasitize nematodes. It's just not as common. And um, they do eat each other too, which yep. is a little disturbing. Um, sure. <laughs> so that's not uncommon in the animal kingdom. <laughs> a lot of a lot of animals will try to, especially in like the north where food is limited, they'll like polar bears will try to eat the young of other polar bears and such like oh. that. Okay. So I heard a lot of, um, negative functions of nematodes. Are there some positive ones? Um, can you kind of touch on those again? What were the positive functions that nematodes have in the soil? I would argue that the only negative function they have is by parasitizing plant roots. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. only negative in the context of economics where the plant root is, is corn or beans or fruit or something like that, where the farmer is trying to raise that to make money and the nematodes harm the ability. Uh, every other function that they have, even if it is a predator prey relationship is very necessary and beneficial. Like, like I said okay. before, if you don't have the nematodes that that prey on other nematodes, then you're going to end up with more of the type of nematodes that feed on bacteria and fungi, which can then harm the bacteria and fungal populations, which are necessary and beneficial to the soil. So it's all interconnected. And if you take away one, then you're going to change the relationships that others have. Like th these systems have something called redundancy built into them. Uh, and that, that means that you know, you take away one aspect of the system and the whole thing's not going to collapse. There is layers of redundancy. So uh, to use an easier example, uh, we'll take our ever-present forest ecosystem. If you take away rabbits, there are other grazers in that forest who fill a similar role to rabbits where this, the whole forest ecosystem is not going to collapse. But without rabbits, you're going to affect the fox population or the raccoon population that will probably try to eat the young of the rabbits. Uh, and then if you affect the fox population, they're going to affect um, other other rodent species that they may try to feed on. So you might get an explosion of mouse, mice or voles, and, and that affects the system. So there is an amount of redundancy built in where the system doesn't collapse, but it does change. And the same is true in the soil. Got it. Got it. So Jim, share with us your experience with nematodes. I'm sure you have some, although it sounds like for farmers, it's negative. Yes. That's what Zach was talking about before with the, uh, when they're parasitizing the, uh, plant root, uh, soybeans are quite, uh, prominent in that, uh, nematode resistance has been bred into, plant species to try to overcome this. And uh, the uh, balance that Zach's been talking about as we've gotten away from rotational agriculture and gone into monoculture, it's disturbed the balance in there so that the nematodes that will attack plant roots uh, are gaining traction in their population. And economically, farmers feel they have to stay in that type of rotation in order to you know, pay the bills. So now you've imbalanced the system and the ones that give you trouble um, start to flourish and, and be problematic. And so uh, the industry has tried to go at that directly by breeding in resistance, which either changes the way the root reacts to them or it's too difficult for them to penetrate. Um, there are various mechanisms that they can breed into the plant to overcome that. But in reality, if we really wanted to fix it permanently, we'd try to restore the balance back to where the predator-prey relationship was correct. But again, that requires a different type of cropping system, which may not be profitable. So the farmer is kind of in a bad position there uh, trying to do it through rotation. So uh, they're doing it through breeding and other type of chemical approaches also. But the uh, system is very quick adapting to chemical changes. So really the breeding has been the most successful because they'll just work around the chemicals very, very quickly, just like everything else. So you've got to work within the system to try to get some control there and uh, try to keep it economical for the farmer too. Guys go to certain types of rotations that do help with um, the nematode problem, but it can't really 
uh, be fixed totally that way with such a short window or certain type of rotation that's economically viable for the farmer. So uh, the actually approaching it dead on through breeding or through chemicalization is the way most people are doing it. And it can be very, very significant. I mean, when you get uh, nematode infestation, then at the beginning, Zach was talking about their size. Um, it, when you dig up a, a soybean plant that's been damaged from a nematode, you can see some, but you have to really take soil samples and send it to a laboratory so they can put it under a microscope to actually get the total count. You may see just a few, but it may be uh, vast numbers in there that are microscopic that you can't see. So that's why uh, when guys are testing for uh, nematode damage, you, you have to take a sample and send it off to a lab that they can put under a microscope. But the damage from uh, nematodes, particularly in soybeans, but like Zach said, you can see it in other crops too, but it's been most uh, noticeable in soybeans. And we've had some problems with them over the years. And we've we've always felt that following the growers program, we create an environment that keeps that predator-prey relationship where it belongs and see then having to pay for that genetic modification or for that chemical, we can start backing down on that a little bit and, and try to keep the profits up for not having another uh, outgo of cash flow, basically. So this this issue you're bringing up here is is very interesting, actually, because you're, you're kind of bringing up the issue um, of giving a temporary solution almost. That's what I'm hearing, because if I'm using a genetically modified organism, one of the disputes with them, one of the one of the problems is that everything else around it evolves. So I'm using a genetically modified organism and it works for a season, right. maybe two, maybe three. Right. And then all of a sudden, the soil microbes, the nematodes have adjusted, right. they have evolved, and they can break through that. And now I have to spend money to use something else and use something else. And it's it's constantly bringing that battle in. Um, so it's not really a long-term solution. It's just uh, for this season, I have to make the money. Yeah, no, it's That's a, very stressful for a farmer, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. And see, the whole system is stressed from that. And see, when you start to modify plants, Plants, their ability to modify them now, the you know the science is saying that it's totally safe. But you have some scientists that say we haven't proven that yet. That we haven't done the actual feed testing to know uh, that that modification is totally safe. Because uh, to notice if you have any damage from feeding it, how long does that actually take? And see that's. Uh, um, the industry's going so quickly that uh, there's no time to, to do that actual testing. So there's still a lot of unknowns on that. And now we, we just politically set up sides as what what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. And so um, that that leads to a whole a whole different discussion. And I think <clears throat> Zach's done a real fine job of explaining how these populations and trying to keep them in balance and work within the system is really the way we want to try to approach this thing. And uh, I think the COVID-19 has pretty well proven this. You know, you, you aren't you aren't going to run over Mother Nature. She's she's going to run the show and your your best success is to figure out how to work with her and see all the vaccine trials, uh, all these clinicals are they actually work with the virus to try to see how the virus responds because uh, it'll work right around it. Because Ma's, she's pretty good at that. Absolutely. That's, I like that, that uh, tangent there. It's good. Yep. Um, Zach, so w one other thing I was thinking about um, as we're talking about this is, um, these nematodes are, are very different from what we talked about with bacteria and um, fungi before. Can you just give us a little plug um, how they, they differ um, in terms of their roles and functions? Yeah, you get a lot more of the predator-prey relationship. So bacteria and fungi, by a large margin, their populations are mainly concerned with breaking down organic matter. So they're, they're decomposers. They're faint, focused on detritus. They're not attacking anything that's alive. Nematodes, 
as I said, a small, small population of them will do that, but they're primarily going after other living organisms, be that plants or bacteria or fungi or other nematodes. And so they, they, they much more fill the, uh, the wolf, the fox, the bear, well, maybe not the bear as much, um, that kind of role, the predator role in that ecosystem, whereas the other ones fulfill the, the first, the early trophic levels of, of uh, functionality going after dead matter or, or even herbivores to a degree. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, any final thoughts, either of you, on um, nematodes or issues farmers are facing um, with soil microbes these days? Yeah, I just think it's, um, um, I, I like the way Zach, you're working up the food chain, basically. And there mm -hmm. were several points that Zach made that I didn't, I didn't know this idea that they consume bacteria. And as they consume bacteria, they exude ammonia out into the system. And that's just another source of nitrogen. Uh, we, we apply a tremendous amount of nitrogen particularly in North America. As as many scientists have said, farmers in North America are love, in love with nitrogen and see the we're breathing 79% nitrogenous gas. And so there's, there's a tremendous number of sources of nitrogen that uh, we can take advantage of to help feed the crop. And see, that way it holds down on expense of bringing more into the system plus the loss in the system that gets into the waterways. So uh, trying to balance this biological population uh, to get the maximum release for the plant, it's, it's absolutely critical from the economic standpoint, but it's also very important from the environmental standpoint also. When nitrogen's cheap, mm -hmm. nobody cares. But if nitrogen would become into large demand in other areas of industry, uh, it could be a very significant problem for farmers to buy cheap nitrogen. So you got to figure out how to use what's in your system to begin with. And the the nematode is just like the bacteria and the fungus. They, they can be very functional on that. Farmer just has to figure out how to make them work better. And see, that's what we mm -hmm. try to help guys with, with the growers program, trying to keep your system functioning to its maximum so that you don't have to bring as much outside input into the system. That's better for you yeah. economically, plus uh, eventually environmentally, that's going to, you're going to be required to uh, define what you're bringing in. And if you can keep that at a lower mass, that's going to be much more beneficial to you. And more of a long-term yeah. solution yep. as opposed yep. to being a short-term yep. fix. Yep. No, meet, meet yeah. the next next quarter statistics. You know that that's what the a lot of industries every quarter we got to have so much more and see that that's only short term solutions. What is the long term factor? Yeah. One last thing that I'd like to add too, and I forgot to do this when I introdu introduced nematodes, but being as they are larger than a lot of other soil microbes. Uh, they require more space. And so they actually mainly live in the water membranes on and in between soil particles, but to have those membranes, you need to have porosity. So nematodes generally are more populous in soils that are coarser, meaning that there's larger soil particles, which means that there's larger pore spaces in between them. So if, if you're trying to encourage healthy nematode populations, you need to have pore space which means you need oxygen. And, and these are the same things that you need for pretty much every other soil microbe as well. That's a really good plug, Zach. That's very, that's a good point. Um, any final thoughts? All right. Well, then this is the end of our fourth installment in our soil microbe series on nematodes. And um, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe and share with a friend. If you'd like to learn more about the Growers Program, visit our website, www.growersmineral.com.